bottom of your group, bottom of your group, and the group less by other females, and group other females less. But they do stay with you, and they do have kids. So maybe what we're seeing is being passed on through the female genome. But there's another possibility as well, and that is if you look at the maternal behavior of these females, it leaves a lot to be desired. There's a high incidence of neglect and abuse early in life among these females, and if their offspring are able to survive, then they're, they're, these females tend to be overly restricted and prevent, uh, restrict their interest from going out, exploring, and interacting uh, with other peers. So maybe what we're seeing in their offspring is not so much a function of the mother's genes, but a, mother's of, a function of their mother's less than adequate maternal behavior. And of course, in the wild, you can't tell these apart. But you can in the lab, where it's possible through cross-fostering procedures and others, to separate out these genetic and environmental effects. And that's what we've been able to do with a variety of other rearing procedures. The one I want to talk about the most is something that we call peer or together, together peer only or together together rearing. Peer monkeys are separated from the biological mothers at birth. Hands are in the neonatal nursery and then within the first week of life, the first month of life, put in with other peers like other youngsters like themselves where they live with one another 24 hours a day until they're about six or seven months of age. And then we move them into larger social groups that contain their mother reared counterparts. So the differential social experience I'm going to talk about is only for the first six months of life. Thereafter, mother reared and pure reared monkeys are growing up in the same physical and social environment. And during the six months, these pure reared monkeys develop hyper attachments to one another, attachments that are probably stronger than between mother and infant. Yet these attachments, while very powerful, are actually non functional or even dysfunctional because these monkeys spend too much time clinging to one another instead of going out to explore their base. And not surprisingly, because a peer is not nearly as good as a mother, you know, less than an optimal mother at providing a secure base for being able to soothe and console um, its partner when it gets upset. And when these monkeys get to the age where they should be starting to play with one another, they do develop patterns of play, but the play never reaches the level of complexity or sophistication that you see in your mother your counterparts. Um, it's usually short-circuited, and never really starts to expand like you see during the months four, or five, and six of life for these uh, mother-reared monkeys. So these peer-reared monkeys, even though they're living with potential playmates 24 hours a day, are actually playing deprived of it as they are growing up. And this has its consequences. For one thing, peer-reared monkeys, as they get older, seem to be more fearful than seems that would seem obvious. They look very much behaviorally like that 20% subgroup I was talking to you about before, of naturally monkeys in naturally occurring groups that I was talking about before. Not only are they more fearful, they show higher levels of HPA activity, at least throughout the first year of life, whether you're measuring it in plasma, in blood, or in saliva, or more recently, as we've been able to do, measuring it in hair, there's a much more short-term and long-term HPA activity under comparable circumstances in pure root monkeys. Not only are pure root monkeys more fearful than mother root ones, they're also more aggressive. And as they get into the second and third year of life, they start showing these explosive patterns of aggression. That's again characteristic of this 5 to 10% of the population in naturalistic troops. And not only do they have higher rates of aggression, they also have lower levels of CSF 5 HIAA. Whether you're looking during the first year when these levels are relatively high, or later in life, this is actually year five, um, when the levels have dropped for everybody, but if anything, the real condition differences have gotten bigger as the monkeys have gotten older. This is not the product of genetic differences. This is the product of individual uh, um, differences in early rearing. We, when we run monkeys to the period monkeys to the uh, my colleagues at the alcohol institute, run them through the happy hour, we find that as a group, period monkeys consume significantly less alcohol as a group than their mother reared counterparts. And very recently, we've been able to do some neural imaging studies of these monkeys. So here, for example, our PET scan data, which was published a couple of years ago. These are looking, these are data uh, collected, PET scans of two and a half year old monkeys who were either mother reared or peer reared for the first six months of life. And what you see here on the left is serotonin binding potential, and on the right is cerebral blood flow. And the comparisons are between front view, mother reared versus peer reared, top view, mother versus peer, side view, mother reared versus peer reared, and similarly for cerebral blood flow, mother versus peer, mother versus here, mother versus peer. What simple inspection showed is that the peer root monkeys' brains are lighting up a lot less than are their mother root counterpart. When you look at the actual data, that turns out to be exactly the case. Throughout the brain, 
whether it's little fay, thalamus, scale, temporal, or frontal regions, the pure reared monkeys in red have significantly lower levels of serotonin binding potential than their mother reared counterparts. And I could superimpose a graph of showing a cerebral blood flow, we would see exactly the same pattern throughout the brain. We are about to publish another paper looking at serotonin 180 receptors, again, PET scan data, the same sort of differences are emerging. We have in press a paper using structural MRIs looking at three-year-old mother versus peer-reared monkeys. The, the MRIs are quite different between the two um, rearing groups. So not only are these monkeys uh, showing is this peer rearing having effects on their behavior and emotional regulation, more fear, more aggression, on their HPA activity, higher levels of cortisol, on their monoamine metabolism, lower levels of CSF5-HIAA. But even in terms of brain structure and function, these rearing condition differences are having profound effect. Now very recently, and we haven't published these data yet, we've been starting to look at what are called genome-wide scans, looking across the entire genome of monkeys who were reared either by their mother or with peers during their first six months of life. And the first set of data I want to show you are what are called methylation data that he's got. These are data collected and collaborated and analyzed by my friend and colleague Moshe Ziff at McGill University, part of one of my Mimi's outstanding research group. And Moshe's been able to do genome-wide scans, scan every gene in, in a particular sample to see whether that gene is methylated or not methylated. When a gene becomes methylated, its expression is, is uh, at least in theory, reduced relative to non-methylated genes. And when Moshe did this, looking at uh, tissue collected from fully adult monkeys, eight-year-old monkeys, from prefrontal cortex on the one hand, and from lymphocytes, T-cell lymphocytes in blood on the other, what he found was astonishing. Fully one-fifth of the entire rhesus monkey genome is differentially methylated. Over 4,400 genes are either more methylated mother reared or peer reared across the genome in both prefrontal cortex and in lymphocytes. So here is uh, an example of this. This is chromosome by chromosome analysis. Top line is pre prefrontal cortex. Bottom line in each chromosome is, is a T cell lymphocyte blood samples. If a bar, a bar, each bar represents an individual gene that's either significantly more regulated or methylated, if, if it's in mother reared, if it's above the line, significantly more methylated than pure reared, if it's below the line, and what you see is there are a hell of a lot of genes being differentially methylated as a function of that first six months of life. About 2,000, about half of the genes are more methylated uh, for your mother reared, about half the genes are more methylated than pure reared. And the numbers and proportions are about the same in prefrontal cortex as in blood cell. So that's the example of chromosome 1 and 2. Here's chromosome, just to take another example, 7 and 8. Here's the X chromosome. Here, interestingly enough, the predominant pattern, at least in prefrontal cortex, is that mother reared monkeys, or those genes, are over methylated. The second thing that we notice from this analysis, and again, it's the first shot of the thing is that there's a lot of consistency and overlap in patterns between what you find in prefrontal cortex in brain and what you find in, in blood cells. So here, for, for example, on the top line is for chromosome 1. In that particular region, the same genes that are being openly methylated in mother ear are also being openly methylated uh, in mother ear in prefrontal cortex and in lymphocytes. So you can, what you're seeing in lymphocytes is essentially the same as what you're seeing in prefrontal cortex. Same is true over here. For those genes, which are more methylated in period monkeys, you see the same pattern in prefrontal cortex as in blood. There's about 30% of all the differentially methylated genes have this pattern of overlaps. And you see the same thing in prefrontal cortex as in lymphocytes. Here, in chromosome X, you see the opposite pattern. Here, if it's the same genes that are over, over methylated in mother beard in prefrontal cortex, are over methylated in pure beard in in, um, in lymphocytes. It's almost as if you're getting an immune response to either what's going on in the brain or reaction cover, uh, or in what's going on contemporaneously associated with it. Find regions like this as well, maybe 25% of the overall genome. So again, between those two sets, 55% of the genes that are differentially methylated, you have either predictable overlap in one direction or in the opposite direction in both brain and blood cells. And the reason this is potentially important is you can get brain cells only once, but you can get blood cells every week. 
And that's what we're doing now. We're now tracking this longitudinally, starting at birth. The other thing that's of interest is you can identify particular genetic pathways where the genes are involved, where we know what, what the genes are that are involved in these pathways. Here's serotonin transporter, for example. Again, again prefrontal cortex and, and lip sites. And here are the genes in this pathway that are differentially methylated, either hypermethylated in, in mother beard, none of them are, for this particular one, or hypermethylated in nursery beard, and in some cases, for this set of genes, the pattern is the same. In some cases, you get an effect and they away the prefrontal cortex, but not in lymphocytes with MAOP, and MAOA, you get the opposite pattern. And you can do this for virtually every pathway that we know about. Here is CRH, the beginning of it, of the cascade of the APA activity thing. Starts off with the corticotropin releasing hormone. There are lots of genes that are very much affected by early experience. And in fact, here are the genes. And again, you see some overlap between the prefrontal cortex and uh, T cells, some in the same, some where they're operating separately and some where they're operating in exactly the different, same different pattern. Okay, this is, these are, so these differential early experiences even can be picked out in patterns of differential methylation, even in adulthood, and it's affecting a fifth of the entire genome. We have another collaboration involved with Jim Heckman, an economist at of all things at the University of Chicago, but more importantly, Steve Cole, a molecular biologist at UCLA. And Steve Cole is able to do microarrays, again, genome-wide. In this case, he's looking at lymphocytes, again, taken from blood samples, but now looking at monkeys who will be four months old. And here's the sort of thing you get with that. These are called heat plots. So these heat, heat plots are, if you see red, that means that gene is overexpressed or that DNA code is overexpressed, if you see green, it's underexpressed. What you have going across are individual subjects. So this is mothering, 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 mothering. This is pure, 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 pure. These are individual genes. And what you see is almost no overlap. Mother where mother reared are red, pure reared are green. Where pure reared are mother reared are green, pure reared are red. Four months of age, the differential social experience can already produce those kinds of effects. Again, a major portion of the entire genome. So these, these uh, early experience effects are not only affecting behavior and uh, biological processes and brain structure and function, they're also affecting gene expression. So I mentioned um, that there are, but there is yes, still clearly some genetic, uh, uh, some parable components of these individual differences. So, I mentioned that at the beginning. I hope I've convinced you that early experience can make an effect. The question is, are these genetic and environmental factors operating separately, or do they interact in some fashion? And we've been going at this question uh, most recently, with uh, over the last decade, I think it's not been, by looking at taking a candidate gene approach to look for specific gene by environment interaction. And so when we take all candidate genes, we look at individual genes that have been usually identified by biologists, so psychiatrists as being important, and the regulation of some kind of some aspect of emotion. These are genes that for humans have polymorphisms, say more than one person of the same gene, and for rhesus monkeys as well. So the one we started off with, the one that most people know about, the serotonin transporter gene. This is the gene that's thought to regulate the uptake of serotonin. Um, Presynaptically, it's the same area of operation that where drugs like Prozac have their mode of action. And in both the human case and the rhesus monkey case, there's a polymorphism in this gene due to blood variation. A number of base pairs in the promoter region, such as with the long version of this gene and the short version of this gene. And these different alleles are functionally different because uh, if you look both in the human case and the rhesus monkey case, the short version of the short allele is, is associated with less efficient DNA <coughs> transcription than the long allele. Uh, and this has been attributed by some and some underlying maybe the problem with serotonin metabolism that you see in certain aspects of depression. So the question is, does it make a difference whether you have the long or short allele? And if you have any knowledge of the human literature, it's a mess. Peter Lesh, first report, who does our genetics initially, uh, first reported for humans that humans with the short version of the serotonin transporter gene were disproportionately likely to be hospitalized for severe depression, to be, to be, um, to be um, uh, incarcerated for severe aggression or to be suicide victims. But others have not been able to replicate that finding. Uh, some years ago, there was a landmark study by Cassidy Moffat and that in the group at the London Institute of Psychiatry who reported that a population of, of 
individuals in their mid 20s, um, individuals in that population with a short of serotonin transporter allele had higher levels of depression and more depressive symptoms than individuals with a long version, but only a, only a, they either had a high level of current stress or they just had a history of child maltreatment and abuse. Very recently, that former finding, the, the, high, the relationship between high level of concurrent stress and low serotonin transporter gene has been contested in a metal analysis that I quite personally feel is at best biased and at least, um, uh, well, well, we'll leave it at that, uh, very selective and, uh, in its reporting and did nothing with respect to that the relationship between early differences, early maltreatment, and short allele of being associated with more severe depression. That, is good. that particular finding has not been challenged by anybody. So, um, but for humans, that's for humans. What about for monkeys? Well, we've been able to characterize all the monkeys in our colony. Some had the short allele, some had the long allele, and some had uh, good mothers, and some were pure. The question doesn't make any difference. You find the answer to be interesting. Here's serotonin metabolism. Here, if you're pure, and if you have a short allele, you show a deficit in serotonin metabolism. If you have a long allele, if anything, you're slightly higher in your 5 HIAA concentration. But if you have a good mother, it doesn't make a damn bit of difference which allele you have in a perfectly normal serotonin metabolism. Here's an example of a gene-like environment interaction where I would argue the nature of that interaction can be attributed to a buffering effect of good mother. Good mothers are protecting individuals who carry this gene from showing this kind of deficit. You get the same picture when you look at aggression. Here, if you have a short allele in your peer group, you have a lot of aggression. Same allele good mother, your aggression is lower as low or lower than individuals with the long allele, whether they're mother or period at all. Gene by environment interaction. Buffering the fact of good mother. Even more dramatic when you look at alcohol. <coughs> Here, if you have a short allele and your period, you drink to excess. But if you have that same short allele and you have a good mother, you actually drink less than normal. That may be a genetic risk factor for individuals with poor early environment. May actually be a genetic protective factor for individuals with good early environment. And you can look at uh, we've, uh, you can look at other points in the lifespan. Let's go back to those DNA data. This Brazelton data, where remember I showed you take a toy and move across the infant's eye. The infants who are poorly following that usually tend not to be grow up to be aggressive and impulsive. You break the data down by gene and environment, and once again, nursery reared infants, short allele, poor oriented. Same allele, good mother, perfectly normal oriented. Once again, gene by environment interaction, good buffering, buffering by good mother. And we see it, I can show you other slides, HPA activity, reaction to separation. We see the same pattern of um, mother reared monkeys with good, with adequate mothers are buffering their kids carrying this gene. And we see the same pattern for other candidate genes. Here's MAOA. MAOA was also described by Casper and Moffitt, individuals with the less, uh, in that same population, individuals in their study who had the less efficient MAOA uh, gene and also had a history of childhood maltreatment and abuse, had very high levels of aggression. If they lacked that early history of uh, maltreatment, having the less efficient gene, incurred no greater risk of showing high aggression than having the more efficient version. We brought our rhesus monkeys have a functionally, structurally different, but functionally equivalent a polymorphism in that same gene, and we replicated the same findings that cast in market. And then six or seven other candidate genes that we published and, and colleagues have published over the last five or six years. Uh, BDNF gene, NOS, NOS gene, neuropeptide Y, uh, uh, new opioid gene, um, uh, here SNPs of the CRH gene, again, for which there's a polymorphism in humans and a polymorphism in rhesus monkeys. And in every case, we find that the less efficient version of the gene, when paired with peer rearing, leads to deficits. That same gene, the yeah, less efficient version of the gene, when paired with good mothering, is, gives you better or normal results. So here, for example, is the SNPs in the CRH gene, the Stephen Barr just published these papers. Uh, here's mother rearing. Here's risk, the so called risk allele. Alcohol consumption, it's very low, very high in individuals who are pure reared. Individuals carrying the same allele that have a good mother are actually drinking less than anybody else. So consistently we see this gene by environment interaction buffering by good mother. And what has been telling us is good mother is pretty damn important in protecting individuals who are carrying these top genes that might or alleles that otherwise might put them at risk for less than optimal developmental outcomes. So we've been spending the last couple of years 
really looking very carefully at these early mother infant interactions. And I want to show you some illustrative videos. <coughs> this first video is a two, two month old infant. It's at the age where it's starting to leave its mother. This is a low ranking mother. Has a very nice attach she has a very nice attachment with her infant. As the tape starts, a fight is growing, is brewing up to the infant's right, to the, to the stage right, and the infant wants to go check it out. The mother, being a little ranky, can't afford to let her infant get involved in that fight because she doesn't have the club to rescue it, so watch what she does. See the infant looking out to see that? Grab, mother grabs the infant and grabs a flower. <laughs> you can see the fight, the monkeys in the fight running away. Look at that face-to-face -face interaction. You have to understand that monkeys aren't supposed to do that. Humans are the only ones who are supposed to have face-to-face -face interaction. Mm -hmm. Let's play that again. <laughs> it's looking up. Mother grabs the kid, grabs the flowers. In the corner, you can see the legs of the monkeys running away, so the fight's over. Face to face interaction. Again, this was some thought to be exclusively human. Maybe chimpanzees would do it, but in 50 years of mother infant studies and mother infant interaction going back to Harlow and Hine, nobody's ever reported face to face. Here's a 19 day old. Tiffany Fields separately, 
they reported that newborn human infants can imitate the facial expressions of their mothers a few hours after birth. It drops out at about 30 days in human infants. They never follow this for a So now Pierre is doing a facial thing. Mm -hmm. the The Vizalatum group thinks this, this early imitation is the first, in, first instance of mere neuron activity. Here's another three day old infant. Now, this is one of our cats in on. Cats are going to do tongue protrusion.
So we're now recording with EEG for very young ones. This is our first pattern. Um, this was the first time we ever did it. We have surface electrodes, very crude, but still able to generate a signal and generate different patterns depending on whether it is imitated or not. We got a little bit better. Now we're using the same kind of caps, the electro caps that they used for the human infant studies. Um, this was our first prototype. The monkey's not too happy because it's not fitting too well, but we improved it a little bit and we have pink ones for the female monkeys and blue ones for male monkeys. And when we these things, what we find during periods of imitation is consistent and significant deceleration, de the desynchronization of slow wave alpha in the parietal regions of the brain. Exactly what you'd expect to see if there were mirror neuron activity. But we don't, we don't see this pattern when these monkeys are presented non imitative stimuli. We don't see these patterns during control periods. We don't see these patterns during function non imitative. So we now have identified an EEG pattern or marker that can go along with our behavior metrics. And one of the things that we're doing with this stuff in the presence of things is we're trying to look at eye tracking, using eye tracking and see what these infants are looking at, imitators and non imitators, look at how they react to different facial stimuli um, with looking at EEG and seeing whether we can take monkeys who by day three are not imitating and get them back up to speed by presenting them with lots and lots of facial and social imitative stimuli. The same they would be getting if they would work with their mothers because obviously under normal circumstances infants in the nursery aren't getting two minutes of this, two instances of this stuff every five minutes uh, as long as they're alive, as long as they're awake. So before I finish by putting these all these findings to the comparative uh, perspective, I just want to acknowledge some of the people who have contributed to this, this latter imitation work in our lab. Uh, these are the additional individuals, Karma, um, Pierre, Pierre, and, and uh, his colleagues, including uh, Giacomo Rizzolatti, and Fox, and a student at Maryland, living this at the Pisa Therapy at Mount Lua, just to get this start. Let me finish by putting the gene by environment interaction story into a comparative perspective. When we started uh, looking at gene by environment interaction, we expected that this would be, uh, we saw it in our recent monkeys as it was reported in, uh, in humans, and we thought this was a general phenomenon. We see it in all primates. So we started looking at it in other primates. And the first species we looked at, through a variety of circumstances, was the Barbary macaque. This is a species of macaque that's indigenous to Africa. It's the only one coming from Africa. The rest are from Asia. It's thought to be the ancestral species, by the way. Um, it can be found in Algeria, Algeria, Tunisia, Morocco. These are the monkeys who are on the island of Gibraltar, except in all these places they're almost lost. They are virtually uh, highly endangered. Um, on my own guess is 50 years from now you won't find any of them in the wild. But there's one place where places where they're doing really well. And that is in a variety of nature parks scattered throughout Europe. There's one in, in Zala near Lake Constance in southern Germany, there's one in the Alsace region of France, there's one near Toulouse, there's one in the Eiffel region of Turkey, and I think there's a new one in Britain. In each of these places, these are privately run nature parks where individuals who own maybe 200 acres of forest by annual fence here cut pathways for them and release maybe 200 of these barbary macaques into the enclosure and then open it to the public. And every day during the summer, thousands, literally thousands of tourists plop, come to the park, plop down their 10 euros, pick up their cameras, pick up bags of popcorn and spend the day eating the monkey's popcorn and snapping pictures in their faces, young and old alike. If you tried that with rhesus monkeys, you'd have 20 lawsuits in the first 10 minutes because the rhesus monkeys would terrorize the tourists. They'd steal their cameras, they'd chase them away, they'd bite them, they'd take over the place and not let any humans in, just like they, they evacuated the Indian Ministry of Education when they took over the building in New Delhi a couple of months ago and they took over a small town in northern India. These are aggressive monkeys. But barbaries are not. They're not aggressive to, to uh, humans, and they're not aggressive towards one another. In fact, they, males are getting involved, actively involved in the caring of infants here. They're crossing the baby back and forth, and off camera, and the monkey mother would never stand for that. And when they get into fights, it's all bark and no bite. They may threaten and, and yell at one another, or bark at one another a lot, but it almost never escalates into the point of physical aggression. So we got really interested in what the serotonin function might look like, and we were able to by the group, get some blood samples from these individuals. We just recently got CSF, so we don't know the story about 5 HIAA, but we do know the story about serotonin transporter gene. And you may recall that for rhesus monkeys, 
with respect to serotonin transporter, which is a tough one for us to use. They have a lot of wheels and they have short wheels. But what about bar root pads? When we looked at all of our samples from bar root pads, we couldn't find anybody with a short wheel. We couldn't even find anybody with a long wheel. Instead, all the bar root pads we sampled had an extra long version of the serotonin transporter gene. And we thought this might be a founder effect, so we looked at several, seven different uh, of these major parts where the monkeys, founder monkeys that come from different places in the wild range. So it's not a founder effect. So then we got some data from pigtail macaques. Pigtail macaques are a little bit larger than these monkeys. They're indigenous to Southeast Asia, Thailand, and, and Indonesia, but they never can make it into areas outside of the tropics. They're physically larger than often used to. They're another uh, some primate facilities have lots of them. They're bigger than rhesus monkeys, but they're not nearly as aggressive. We already know that they have higher levels of CSF5, HIAA, and you match your size, age, and, and gender than rhesus. And they also, in this case, only well, we have long serotonin transporter G. No shorter wheels. So then we went to see Bernard Perry at Strasbourg, who has a beautiful colony of continent macaques. These are macaques that are indigenous and only to be found in a very small part of, of uh, this island of Sulawesi in the, Indonesia. And twice as big as recent monkeys are arguably much more attractive, and much less aggressive, only long on the You can see where this is going. Crabby macaques, uh, indigenous to Southeast Asia, but you can't find them outside of the tropics. And they're smaller than recent monkeys, some would say they're a lot. They're dumber and more skittish, but they're less aggressive, and they also have a little short of wheel. The stumptail macaques coming from India, they are also highly endangered. You, uh, um, they, you, they're like, their range overlaps with rhesus monkeys, but rhesus monkeys can live in a hell of a lot of places that stumptail monkeys cannot. So years ago, the famous primatologist Franz de Ball cross fostered a group of rhesus monkey infants into a stumptail group, and we then ended up with very mellow rhesus. Rhesus monkeys, as long as they stayed in the stuff here, group, and when they got out, that's a different story. Only long of the arm. So finally, we looked at, we got some blood samples from Tibetan macaques, from obviously Tibet. And just as we were analyzing these samples, I got a call from my friend and long term colleague, Carol Bergman, uh, who's probably one of the world's experts in macaque mother infant interactions. She's been studying these for over 30 years. And she had just come back from a field visit to Tibet, where she had been commissioned by the Chinese government to check out these Tibet, Tibetan macaques to see if they might be suitable for nature parks, just like the Barbary macaques were. I got this call from Carol saying, Steve, I don't know, to, don't know what to do. I just come back to the field to check out these uh, Tibetan macaques. The literature shed, says they should be pretty well. They're the most aggressive monkeys I've ever seen in my life. They make rhesus monkeys look like pansies. They push tourists off of nature trail paths. So, Carol, that's the best news I've heard in a long time because we just genotyped them and they're a homozygous version, a short version of this video. Now, I'm the last person in the world who's a genetic determinist, and I certainly don't believe that there's a one-to-one -one relationship between any one gene uh, and its general alleles and any complex pattern of behavior, but you have to notice there's more than a apparent coincidence of this kind of relationship. But there's something else in this figure, and that is if you look at all of these, only one of them, it's got a polymorphism. And when people have looked at other primate species, there's one exception. None of these other species have a polymorph. Great apes. They all have the serotonin transporter gene, but they're all homozygous, either for a long version or a short version. You look at baboons, all homozygous, even when they look at range. And if you look at these other candidate genes, the AOA, the four genes that I described earlier, in which humans and rhesus monkeys have a polymorphism. None of these other species have those polymorphisms. They've got the gene, but not the variation. So what's different about humans and rhesus monkeys from all these other primate species? The one thing that's different is they can live anywhere. And maybe, just maybe, one of the secrets to their success, and perhaps as well, is not some kind of genetic specialization. It's genetic diversity. I want to thank the many people who contributed to this work, some of who are listed here, and I thank you for your time.
not obviously one of our regular meetings, but this being an award lecture, we don't have the same sort of uh, uh, sparring match with the speaker. But he has very kindly agreed to take a few questions. Um, and so let's go straight into that. If Maggie, if you can find our roaming mic here, which I don't uh, see, I'd be grateful. Um, while we're waiting for the roving mic, I'll use the opportunity to ask a question myself, Dr. Sylvia. Thank you for absolutely beautiful work and, 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 and brilliant presentation. Um, the, there's a very tiny little thing, I'm only saying it because we're looking for the mic. Have you noticed, or has somebody else noticed, that the Mrs. Monkey emails always cradle on the left? Um. Yes, it's working. Maybe we had a left-handed photographer. Somebody's <laughs> actually studied that, and it's 50-50. There is a slight bias towards that. There's a slight, uh, there's a, a fairly large uh, literature on both handed flatter, handed laterality and neuroimaging laterality. And it seems that A, um, some monkeys are right-handed and some are left-handed. A few more are right-handed than are left-handed, both in hand preference and reverse in hand. Um, there are developmental changes, so individuals tend to become more right-handed as they get older, which I think is uh, something uncomfortable. But the, and there is for sure laterality, and it it's becomes a big issue when you start looking at both those areas and the equivalent of it, and there is some outstanding work done by Bill Hopkins and others working with chips on the one hand and the hats on the other, hopefully we will collaborate with, with him. But I think if, if that, left side uh, nipple sorts of thing um, represented as anything would be relatively slight and probably rare in the selection of the shots. Well, that, there you have the problems of small sample sizes because I counted seven out of eight <laughs> left <laughs> refrained in the draw. So we don't have but, our but own... I, but we, we, might have have we might have put the sliding backwards too. <laughs> <laughs> okay. yeah. So uh, 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 for some reason we don't have our roving mic, so we don't just have to have uh, shouting from the audience. Uh, and Jan Pekseth, uh, it looks like he wants to shout. Yes, Dave. <laughs> uh, it's really wonderful to see uh, you know, a presentation that can pack in so much information with such a coherent story. Um, thanks. Uh, that's kind of a two-part question. One is simply a factual one. Uh, since uh, all this research, in a sense, started with uh, trying to understand social bonding, has your laboratory already initiated a program to work out the mechanisms of social bonding? Does oxytocin come to mind? Yes. Uh, uh, yes tell us what's happened. Yes. Uh, sorry. Uh, some of you may know that. Um, Sue Carter, who I call uh, Professor Oxytocin, the Oxytocin Lady, uh, and I have been talking for almost 15 years about uh, using her uh, interest in studies of oxytocin uh, and providing with her uh, studies of monkeys, particularly the early rearing differences, because that's where I would expect to find major differences, uh, either in periphery or even in brain. And for years and years, she said, we don't quite have the option. Either we nor anybody else has a decent oxytocin measure, uh, because you may know that we have uh, Insel and, and uh, Linsel and Gerke spent 10 years trying to find it, and find any you know, the receptors in the brain uh, in rhesus monkeys. Um, they think they've got the assay now. We think we've got the uh, appropriate postdoc who's actually working in an NIMH lab, um, uh, Lisa Pfeiffer, uh, post, uh, the daughters of the with Sue, and we are, have initiated. Uh, both looking for oxytocin genes and their polymorphisms um, and uh, getting measures of oxytocin production uh, such uh, peripherally as not centrally uh, in our differentially weird monkeys. And I would be amazed if we don't have a nice story to tell. And I would love to be the first to talk to you. Too early. Uh, let me ask that second part, which is kind of a more socially relevant question. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of debate right now to what extent the primate uh, information it should be informing us about human nature in a very practical way. Uh, you know, people ever since Colby have used the environment of evolutionary adaptation, EEA, as kind of a shorthand for saying that something very important evolved in our species that 
if we could understand that EEA, it would guide us in better child-rearing practices. And uh, since you have done more work on you know, child-rearing in a, any primate uh, that's really been followed in detail, do you have anything to share with respect to how we should be shifting our child-rearing policies? Can I get a pretty good question? Okay, um, let me, uh, this will be a multifaceted answer. What I have to share is some, some history and, and some advice, uh, if not instructions, I've get, been given by my uh, administrators at DRIH in the Public Information Office who say, whatever you do, interviews or presentations, stick to the monkey data. Uh, sometimes when people didn't, uh, a la Fred Goodwin, about 15 years ago, uh, talking about our data, um, he no longer was head of uh, and I major when he was done with uh, making evolutions of the, the uh, parallels between aggressive young male monkeys and what might be going on in the inner cities. Um, but uh, I will pass on some uh, information uh, or a comment that Robert Hine made uh, following one of my presentations a, a few years ago. And he said, what this work shows, and I'm quoting Hind, is that the best investment you can make is providing support to the mother. Let give the mother the support, uh, whatever it takes, social as at all, that allows her to try to her best to be a good mother, provide a stable, supportive, consistent environment, and under those things, give her uh, teaching help if possible. Um, support that mother in the relationship because it can affect so many things, uh, including we now know a fifth of the increased smoking genome. Thanks. Thanks very much. The, um, so there, there are two more questions. I'm going to not take that many questions, but I'm going to give priority also to those who traveled a long distance. So here's Norman Hunt. Thank you. Thank you again for a lovely presentation of all kinds of things. I want to pick up. Can you hear me? No. no. Uh, yeah. I want to pick up just one moment in this very fine presentation when Dr. Ferrari was moving his head back and forth with the infant monkey uh, testing mirror behavior. When he moves his head to the left, the mirror image would move to the right, to the right shoulder. Or if your muscles are doing exactly the same thing, they would move to the left shoulder. So which way does the mirroring behavior go? Um, Ferrari et al. Um, I'm not sure he was the first author, but they had about three years ago a paper where they looked at that very question. That is, they showed um, monkeys who were being single unit recording so they could demonstrate the thing was going. They showed them um, stimuli that were either mirror stimuli, which would be a sort of normal situation, or they showed, instead of showing them a mirror, they showed a videotape of the actual thing simultaneously, which would be uh, the way, the way, um, which would be the reverse of that. And it followed what you would experience if you were looking at somebody else. Okay. That is, it followed what you would experience rather than the mirror image. So if you moved your right hand and somebody was looking at you, the monkey would move its left hand. Uh, I believe that's how it came out. I know it was, it was they used this study to differentiate these, those two. They came out with a consistent finding and at this hour after all this stuff, I can't remember exactly when it came up, but I think it's in science about three years ago. The alcohol level of that is mine. <laughs> uh, Larry Kunstet, I think I saw your hand up. Yeah, uh, thank you for a really fantastic presentation. I'd like to ask you a question about sexual selection. Is there any evidence that uh, there's a, a practice phase in rhesus infants for adult sexual selection? In other words, do they do anything that emulates what they will do as adults? Oh, absolutely. Uh, a major aspect of their play is involves sexual posturing. Um, and it starts off with, with uh, I, years ago I used to include as part of presentations of the developmental process when we wanted to elaborate a little bit on you know, what's going on in the play. And I think Jack can say a few things about that as well. One of the aspects of play in monkeys is um, they mount each other and, and protect one another. And initially, um, it's more or less indiscriminate. Um, monkey males will mount males and, and females females and males will mount 
females and females will not males. As they get older, it starts getting increasingly uh, sex appropriate, if you want to uh, use those words, at least what you'll see largely in adulthood. But people like, uh, like uh, the group of uh, Young and Boy and, and, uh, and, and others have shown that this could be influenced, these patterns of play can be influenced by prenatal hormones, they can be influenced by social factors. So if you have a female growing up in an all-male group, you'll find that she'll make uh, she'll mount other uh, individuals much more than if she were in a, in a different group. So this is a fairly plastic system, but it's clearly a part of what you see in play. And, uh, you may have heard one, earlier when I said, what two things?